Uh, what I want to go uh, is the, the concept came up about translational research and why would somebody do it and who does it and that was kind of the genesis of our early conversation but as, but as I thought more about the topic it really is more about um, why somebody who does what I do is going to be interested in discovery science and is it, is it a value in we make investments and in people uh, taking time out to go to the laboratory and what's it all about. So I want to kind of address this from a uh, personal perspective to a degree uh, and then more globally to talk about uh, how it impacts what we do. One of the questions that comes up is why would somebody who's a clinician who could, you can, we all know working to get funded research is very difficult and if you are a first time investigator in the laboratory, uh, you might be in your 40s before you get your first R01. And if you had a child that you were sending off to school to get educated and they're going to come home and tell you they're not going to be su successful until they're in their 40s, you might scratch your head and decide whether this is really a good investment in doing this. <coughs> but as I, I reflected on this and looked back on the notion of should we do research since we do it here, and since I have a T32, which is a training grant that uh, we've had for a number of cycles now, which is dedicated to supporting residents coming come in the lab to do research is, uh, why would you do it? Should it be part of a medical school curriculum, which obviously here it is? Um, is it something that people should take time out of their residency and spend time to do, as some of our residents in surgery do, and some of them may stay out for as much as three to four years and get advanced degrees. Uh, several have stayed and gotten their PhD, and is there any logic in, in doing this? Um, and does this actually make a difference long term? In my own experience, I never took time out to get an advanced degree uh, in terms of how I pursued uh, the research opportunity. Um, and is there a, a right time or a wrong time to do it? I think most of us would recognize that as we go through life, there are times that we know if we don't do it now, we're probably never going to do it. And so that's the more common thing for residents who take time out is to do it early, at least in, our, in the Department of Surgery, uh, to do it early in their residency as opposed to waiting to a, um, a later time point uh, in terms of doing things. But when I think back about research, I guess the first bit of research I did actually was in high school, um, in which we were looking at ways to do various things. And my project was to uh, determine whether we could increase the um, recovery of planaria that had been cut in half by uh, feeding them various doses of amino acids. And so that was my project, and I was very excited about it. And I thought I did a great outcome until I figured out that the concentration of amino acids turned every one of my cultures into now a little amber um, paperweight uh, that had a half of planaria in it. And so we never really got the opportunity to do things. So, but you know, that was an early genesis of deciding that um, there was something very satisfying about the notion of uh, inquiry, and which ended up eventually being a chemistry major and so forth and so on. So that was kind of the motivation to kind of move this forward in terms of doing things. Even the slide projector needs to move forward, right? Okay, you have a better one. Okay. In terms of doing things. And so if we look at the research experience and what it might mean to an individual, uh, it's obviously an opportunity to sp spend concentrated time, have an understanding and experience uh, or a problem of interest, hopefully more than one area that somebody chopped up as a, as a student in, uh, still in high school. The opportunity to have an invested opportunity to learn deeply about a problem and the ability to solve the problem, to, build, to become more skilled at systematic organizational skills and develop critical thinking skills and bridge knowledge and applications in, in very unique ways. And as I've thought about this over the years, I've become absolutely convinced that some of the best things I ever did actually were not in the process of learning medicine, but was learning how to think. Because we talk about a lot of things that we might teach individuals, and that is not likely to be true at some point in their life. Um, as a resident, we were taught uh, for sur G uh, surgery, the gastric surgery was all about that. It was acid that caused ulcers, and you needed to understand all the principles of gastric pH and how it related to surgical resections in the plan of surgery. And then we come to find out when some people at the Royal Adelaide in South Australia figured out that actually this was an infectious process and it wasn't one that was driven by acid solely alone and that in fact it was a curable and treatable disease that didn't require surgery. But the experience was in becoming grounded in trying to be more intellectual 
in analyzing solutions and problems. And I think that is something that carries forward in one who has a strong background in an in inquiry. Now you could argue, well, does that mean you think everybody needs to be a scientist, to be a healthcare provider, to be a physician? No, but what I think it means to me is that someone has to be careful and thoughtful in their analysis of a problem, but also have established peripheral vision, as I like to refer to it, to see what is outside the immediate boundary and about the problem, and how, in fact, you can enter into critical decision making if you're going to solve problems. So if we look at the basis of research, it's about new conceptual ideas, it's about de novo ideas, and it's about outgrowth of ongoing projects that in fact drives the genesis of trying to think more differently about problems and problems that can be solved. Um, most of us appreciate in terms of understanding the scientific method. It's a systematic, controlled, empirical, and clinical, uh, critical investigation of a natural phenomena, and it's guided by theory and hypo hypothesis. It's not guided by someone just sort of looking at something and trying to make a decision on the fly without being thoughtful about the analysis that's at hand. And in fact, how do you determine the efficacy of the decision that you've made? And if we're going to be rigorous in this process, it's about being willing to make the dedication to do the, to do the study, to do the systematic inquiry, and that it's the ability and desire to want to look for new facts. And it's the revision of accepted theories in light of new knowledge and new facts, and then the practical application of the information as we've derived it so that, in fact, we can impact outcomes of patients and their problems and disease populations and societies in terms of doing things. And we can sort of slice this in two directions in terms of the notion of basic discovery science, which is really an inquiry into an unknown previous process and trying to understand it as a phenomena, but also understand the science that drives it. And in some cases, that is done for knowledge for its own sake. I think at one point uh, that was something that was obviously, obviously endorsed, but today we are trying to make a tighter coupling between the inquiry and what is in fact the yield from the inquiry. And to some degree that then takes us into the domain of applied research and understanding the process as well as the phenomena and with the goal of solving a particular identified problem. If we're going to then take all of this and say it has an impact on clinical outcomes, then we into the notion of translation and how do we take it. One of the things that when I came here in 1990 and my predecessor, Dr. Freark, was interested in us developing the Burn and Shock Trauma Research Institute. We had the notion of bench to bed and bed to bench, which today we call translational science. But it was about that thing, taking the problem that was at the bedside that was not solvable, taking it back to the laboratory and using elements of the inquiry that we could do in the laboratory as a way to dissect out the problem and to be able to then find a solution that we might be able to take back to improve patient outcomes. And so if we're going to do this, we obviously have to be rigorous in developing the hypothesis. The literature searches have to be done. There has to be a rational, logical design and methodology. The analysis has to be appropriate to the information that's at hand. Uh, we cannot overinterpretate, but we also should not underinterpret the information we find. We have to be willing to disseminate this knowledge, and what we, for most of us, know that about is doing the work, writing it up, and then sending it out for peer-reviewed process and ultimate publication. That is sort of the way in which we must travel, because that is either the validation of what we've done or the challenge of what we've done. If you can take it through the peer review process and get it in print, get it in publication, then it's an element that sort of, in fact, validates at least some aspect of the effort and allows others to partake in it and begin to either challenge you because of the work that they do, but it's this willingness to engage in this dynamic interchange that can occur obviously face to face when we talk about it, but more importantly it can occur on the worldwide scene in terms of things. So if we're going to approach this in terms of a logical sequence, um, obviously we have to have the theoretical background at our disposal to in fact start to build the case. We have to have a clear statement of what we think the problem is or the purpose of what we're doing. The questions have to be designed in a probing manner. There has to be some relationship to the hypothesis that we're driving. There has to be a sound and workable design and methodology. The data, we need to follow it and understand it. And there has to be an interpretation of the information, then do it. I would actually ask you to stop and think for a minute. Though, if this applied to a patient's problem, to a large measure, when we figure out a patient has a complex problem, 
There are elements of this that map exactly to the same logic pathways that one has to take in terms of the ability of doing a sound analytics of a patient is a complex problem. I take care of a lot of patients in an ICU who have problems and the challenge always is to decide whether the individual thing that which we are sensing is the primary process or is it simply a manifestation of an overarching entity and how do we look at that and more in a global sphere as opposed to focusing on a bunch of parts but missing the actual issue. We're spending too much time looking at the leaves and we're missing not only the tree but we're missing that the forest is, a, is upon us. And so I think that there are elements of this that directly apply to complex decision making and patient care and our ability to work through the problem and challenges. And if you're not willing to have this kind of an analytical process, I think it leads sometimes to confusing approaches to patient care. And I think we have some great examples of this if we look back in history. We look at the work done by Harvey that basically challenged the tenets that Galen had put forward in terms of the capacity for the circulation of blood and really clarified the process that it was a dynamic process, a continuous process, and the, and the heart was the source of the muscular pump that drove this. And so this was really a challenging event for something that had been around for years uh, and challenged the hypothesis of Galen for blood circulation in mammalian in mammals. Uh, Crawford Long uh, was critical, obviously, in the whole issue of the discovery of anesthesia and how it worked and how we, in fact, went through it, did the issues in terms of looking at something that was more about a party celebration because it was a favorite way for those that could afford it to use it. Um, I guess they didn't have a bong, so they did this instead. <laughs> And in fact, was able to do things, but ultimately take this that was a party favor and actually turn it into a phenomenal enhancement in the quality of the care that can be done in patients. And while the surgery wasn't all that complex in this year, but you can imagine someone undergoing an amputation uh, under no anesthesia other than uh, half a bottle of something to drink, um, and then two stout individuals holding them in place with leather straps as they'd go through their amputation. Uh, pretty dramatic that the human could survive that, but obviously many did. But it wasn't certainly the care and compassionate type of care that we would choose to give. Uh, William Stewart Halstead, he was uh, is recognized as the father of scientific surgery, uh, brought up in the uh, Germanic uh, training programs uh, that he brought back to the United States and designed a series of things in terms of looking at uh, basic science elements, bringing it to the bedside, uh, matching it with animal experiments, uh, basic knowledge about surgery, and the use of local anesthetics. Unfortunately, the local anesthetic he was mostly interested in was, was a cocaine derivative that ultimately, in his life, became tragic uh, in terms of his use and exposure to it. So, yes, there are these great opportunities that we can seek to understand. But if we're going to continue to look for new pathways to discovery, Comprehensive understanding must be available to the individual that's going to uh, go on this journey of inquiry about how the body interacts between cells and tissues, how complex biologic systems operate, understand structural biology, molecular libraries and imaging, nanotechnology, informatics, and something that I think is not uh, is a little bit foreign to most of us is this notion of complex systems and how these interact. A complex system is this notion that um, when many parts of a system interact, they can generate behaviors in the whole which aren't found in the parts themselves. And so what does that mean? The interpretation of this or the notion of this, which is mostly coming out of many, uh, is coming out of engineering to a fair degree, uh, is looking at adapted entities and how they interact in a nonlinear fashion. And these interactions between entities uh, at a given scale give rise to this notion of emergent properties um, at a larger scale in space and or time uh, through self-organization without any global knowledge of the critical control. So what might that mean and how might that apply to what we do? Well, we understand that when we look at patients, there's these very robust dynamics, but things are fundamentally hydraulically linked. They don't live in a silo. They interact and processes work together in human biology. And so there is a sensitivity to small changes and system inputs that can either ramp up or ramp down system processes. It's a complex system that are com computationally irreducible. And every time we s seem to get a data element out, we look at it and we think that's going to solve all of our problems, we recognize that it doesn't. It's more complex. It's more interrelated. 
And so it's the issue of making sense of uh, observed systems and properties that require sophisticated nonlinear spatial temporal analysis. Bottom line is, is if you're going to solve a problem just by looking at the parts, the solutions aren't that simple. They're more complex. And again, it requires this kind of rigorous thought process to look at the process, look at the problem, look at the adjacent, critical adjacencies, and how parts relate to each other. And if one is going to attain the goal in terms of things uh, and is going to embark on a period of inquiry in their life, uh, they need to be familiar with these questions and understand, in fact, why, why are we going to do this? What are the objectives? How am I going to support this? Uh, will these um, methods support attaining the broadest objectives? And what will be the impact of the results and interpretations once in time obtained? So our goal, obviously, is to make a difference. Our goal is to impact outcomes. Our goal is our desire to find better ways to do what it is we do and ultimately to inform patient uh, decision making and our outcomes to make things better in the longer haul. So if we kind of go back to this notion of translational research, which obviously has to evolve and build on those kit, uh, um, critical pieces, um, it's a way of thinking about and conducting scientific research to make the result research applicable to the population under study, and in our case, we're talking about patients. And so it's this um, body of knowledge that spans basic biology, clinical medicine, and then health policy. It's broad, and as professionals, it is our obligation and responsibility to take and process information in a unique way and use those resources that we believe that we have been educated and developing all through our schooling and our time to use this in a distinguishing fashion to um, impact outcomes. And to some degree, this is this sort of knowledge-driven ecosystem that we're speaking about, which is a result of multidisciplinary collaboration, meaningful health outcomes, data sharing, and data integration. Putting these various pieces together, which requires one to be facile, at least in understanding how the parts may work together. You may not be capable of doing each one of these independently, but certainly you want to be a participant in a group of individuals or teams that in fact can make this happen. And obviously the penultimate goal of this would be is to, obviously to do the scientific research, to in fact have the clinical translation, having meaningful health outcomes, and at the end of the day, do we in fact change health policy so that it has a broader implication than our application to a subset of patients or people, uh, but something that in fact drives it to a larger extent, and it's the body of knowledge that we create and understand how it works together that allows us to make these kinds of transitions. We well recognize over the last several years there's been a, a difference in terms of the NIH initiatives, in terms of new pathways to discovery, research teams, and re-engineering the uh, clinical uh, uh, research enterprise. And so part of this has been about to accelerate the fundamental discovery and translation of the knowledge into effective prevention strategies and new treatments. We had some early discussions um, with the CDC here um, and the Clean Cookstove Alliance, uh, which is looking at the, the bio burden related uh, to cooking across the world, plus also the fact that significant injuries occur all across the world in the design of elements that are related to cooking in various parts uh, of the world where the uh, burden of burn disease is a significant problem. And the target, uh, the country that has this as the greatest target is India. And the highest incidence of injuries per population and, the, and very uh, high risk in terms of things with very poor prevention strategies and design and defects um, and how uh, food is kept and handled. And when you consider that uh, some families spend 40% of the day gathering their food and their ability to cook it uh, simply to be able to survive, that we have to look at what are, what are the opportunities that we can do differently. The notion of interdisciplinary research and high-risk uh, research and public-private partnerships is what we are all talking about trying to achieve and establish uh, in our own endeavors these days because we want to be able to do this. And then the ability for academic centers to work together is a critical piece, and particularly as this relates to clinical trials. There's a big agenda here in uh, town through the Corey grants uh, that we're participating in as a school, and Dr. Kennedy is taking the lead on that and working as part of that team and doing that. But what do we do? Well, some of us partake in uh, clinical trials and think that's an important thing to bring to the bedside, which we certainly do in the, in the burn unit. We have a number of clinical trials running. 
but also the opportunity to participate with other academic centers. So you might know, most of you probably know this is what's called a heat map. And this is a genomic display of a series of um, probe sets that are derived from white blood cells. So we, are, we were part of a group called a GLUE grant, which was a, um, about a $30 million project um, out of uh, the MGH uh, and also um, another group, a series of groups from across the United States. There was about six of us that participated in this aspect of it. And what this shows is gene arrays as a result of pediatric non-survivors in comparison to survivors, and these are the adult survivors. And so about 90 of these patients came from our unit here. And you can clearly see that you don't have to understand any of it. If you just look at the colors, they're not the same. And in terms of those that are um, uh, in red that are uh, elevated in terms of their uh, gene expression, and those in blue which are downregulated, and how it compares from one subset to another. We obviously, you can see there's a difference in pediatric to adults, but we can certainly see there's a difference in survivors to non-survivors, and this uh, appears to have uh, elements of our time dependence. Let's go out about three weeks. Some of these patients we followed out for a year. And these are some of the pathway signaling alt, uh, changes that have occurred uh, as we look across this. Uh, these are the most significant changes in pathways to look at, and hopefully these will represent targets um, that we can go after and begin to develop. There are elements of this that are now the basis of an incoming trial uh, of looking at the role of beta blockade in terms of um, altering metabolic response and preserving a visceral protein mass um, and actually may in fact have an effect on PTSD development. So some of this data is driving the notion of that uh, in terms of doing things and there are elements of this that are also going to drive probably we think another clinical trial that's going to look at the using a, a derivative growth hormone uh, factor that uh, we can, in fact, try to use for further muscle preservation and uh, maintaining, um, maintaining strength and having less loss. The interesting thing that has come out of this information is we used to talk about the fact that all trauma was the same, burns and trauma kind of go together. But what we now understand in a better way is that the magnitude of the response, and this has to do with dysregulated innate immune response, is actually different between types of injuries. And so if we look at the trauma, it's pretty much recovered in a relatively uh, fast way. The, the curves have the same appearance in terms of the level of dis uh, dysfunction for both um, dysregulated innate immune response as well as adaptive immune response. But the recovery time is way much longer in this population uh, over the time frame. And so this is information we now can sort of use and understand better uh, when we take care of patients about understanding window, windows of opportunity and windows of vulnerability in this population. We also know that uh, patients that don't survive uh, have a couple of different critical pathways that they go through in terms of how they manifest failure, mostly multiple organ failure, so that we can have differential targeting of the um, interventions that we want to try to provide to uh, salvage outcome opportunities. The ability to engage in these conversations so that the team that we were a part of was the MGH, was UTMB Galveston, it was uh, UT Southwestern, and it was the group out of University of Washington, and little old Loyola's in the middle of the pack. That did not happen because we happened to be in Chicago, and they were trying to make this geographically symmetrical to some degree. It was about the fact that we had been engaged in doing this kind of work in the laboratory and at the bedside and doing stuff so that we got to be involved in this level of discovery and, and opportunities to, to go forward. And so that's the other part of this piece. If you have an interest in doing this, what, what tends to be is eventually you want to have an interest in participating with others across the country. And so you had a wonderful exposure not only doing this work with these partners, but then we were able to involve, be involved with the Stanford group that was doing all the work on figuring out the analysis pathways that needed to be done in doing a lot of the genomic assays. So I think at the end of the day, it's fair to say that excellence in research does translate to excellence in patient care. It's how we make a difference and make it better and make it go to the next level. And that in fact, the research that we do today hopefully will be tomorrow's patient care. So if, if we truly are gonna make a difference, we can make a difference because we spend a lot of time trying to take the best care we can of patients. But if we're gonna make an impactful difference, that may in fact have a generational impact, it has to be the willingness to engage in saying, what we do is okay today, but it's not good enough for tomorrow. 
And if we don't drive ourselves to do that, we really are not going to move the agenda. And I guess I would sort of leave you with this notion um, that there is a reason to try to keep an open mind uh, about problems and challenges if you're going to make a difference. So that's kind of the journey that I have personally done, uh, but also made, made the commitment uh, both as chair of surgery or even back east in Vermont when we had residents in the lab, as we found ways to fund them, bring them to the lab and get them excited about stuff. And many of these folks now are out doing their own inquiry and their own development. So part of our responsibility is to improve the quality of the care, but also part of our responsibility is to create the environment in which others can succeed. And in fact, carry, carry this inquiry in a, in a different way um, at institutions all across the country. So um, I think that my answer is, is translational research is important. And I think all of us have to maintain a sense of inquiry and try to decide that you understand things to a level, but maybe we can understand them to the next level and make a more impactful uh, outcome on our patients. So those are my thoughts and free association to some degree. Uh, but certainly willing to answer any questions or engage in a debate.